Okay, our crew's gonna come out and move the things around a little bit and get going. Are you enjoying the conference? Yeah. Yes! Woo! <laughs> all right, and I, by the way, in the midst of all the shouting and dancing, I think literally, it was good. I think we've got some good arguments on both sides. We want to hear that. And I think that lively discussion is particularly helpful right now. And by the way, speaking of that, we're going to be talking about blockchain, which is the core of all of this. Interesting that no matter what we say, think about Bitcoin or the cryptocurrencies, we also hear others saying blockchain, yeah, it's going to be around still. Many of us feel blockchain and the currencies will be there, but we see that it's going to be there. Well, how is that going to affect public banks? Public banks and blockchain is the subject of our next presentation. Ellen Brown is here to talk to us about that. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Ellen Brown. Okay, I guess I was just introduced. I'm not sure <laughs> what was said. So um, my name is Ellen Brown, and I'm going to um, I'm chairman of the Public Banking Institute, and I'm going to talk about public banking and the blockchain, how we can become our own bankers. Okay, so uh, we're living in revolutionary times, uh, not counting what's going on in Washington. There's uh, the IT revolution, which we can now go online and figure out how to do all sorts of things ourselves, basically becoming sovereign in, we can become our own plumbers, we can fix our own cars, or some people can. We can become our own publishers. I've actually written 12 books and three of them I published myself. We can become our own doctors, uh, our own lawyers, and I'm going to argue that we can <clears throat> become our own bankers. Uh, that was actually the goal of Bitcoin, independence from banks and governments. And it did this through two revolutionary features, or purported to do it. It's not clear it's totally done it. Uh, one is that it's a cryptocurrency uh, defined as a digital currency in which encryption techniques are used to regulate the generation of units of currency and verify the transfer of funds operating ooh, independently of a central bank. So that's the critical feature, ind independent of banks. Uh, and it's built on a blockchain, which is um, a distributed ledger, which is a ledger or a, um, something that keeps track of accounts which is online and it's distributed over many computers at once. Uh, so the blockchain revolution allows us to have a currency that is trustless, meaning you eliminate the trusted, allegedly trusted third party middlemen, notably bankers. It's borderless, it can be traded across borders without uh, government interference. It uh, keeps track of transactions in a way that is immutable, meaning it can't be changed. It's uncorruptible, so you can't be re duplicating, rehypothecating, fraudulently hiding things. Um, and it's fully transparent. And it's anonymous. So although it's transparent, meaning you can track it from one place to another, and anybody can, uh, anybody who's allowed to see it can, can see where it's, um, where it's gone, you still are, you the user, are anonymous. So it's like cash, like you can't tell who had the cash before you did, but you know that the cash is good. However, um, Bitcoin can't yet, or that particular model hasn't yet replaced banks and governments. One reason is it's too slow and expensive for widespread commercial use. And another reason is that banks actually, um, or that financial sovereignty would actually mean allowing us to become our own bankers. 
What banks do for us is to allow us to turn our own IOUs or credit into money. Um, Bitcoin is currently only 2% of the US dollar money supply, and it's only 0.2% of M2, which is the circulating money supply, including all the digital money, and yet it uh, can take up to an hour for a transaction. And it can cost like $25 if you want to get in the front of the line. So if you multiply that up by 500, which is what you would have to do in order to um, create a currency that was good, uh, that was equivalent to the U.S. dollar, it, you'd be standing in line for days uh, to get your coffee. But but the model itself is good, or that the uh, cryptographic technological developments have the potential of replacing banks and governments in our financial transactions. So the reason that Bitcoin is slow is that it's based on what I would call an obsolete uh, economic model, which is the gold model, the idea that money is a, is a thing that um, has to be kept scarce and it uh, has to come into existence in a difficult, expensive way, and then it... Um, has to be tracked from, like once it comes into existence, then it's tracked from place to place to place. And you have to keep track of all the money in the whole system in, the, in this whole distributed ledger that would be universal. But there is another way that money can come into existence and that's actually how money is created today. And that is on the mutual credit model where money is just IOUs or debits and credits. Um, so we can see this most easily in the community currency model, where in a digital community currency, for example, they, the example they always use is, is, say, I bake cookies for Sam for five community credits. So I've got a plus five and he's got a minus five. And then he mows Joe's lawn. And so now his, his minus five zeroes out and Joe's got a minus five. And then Joe washes my car for five units, and then all of our money zeroes out. So you had money that came into existence, was there temporarily, and when all the credits were extinguished, it all went back to zero. So in a, if you were keeping track of that cryptographically, you don't need you can ignore that particular transaction. You only need to keep track of the digits that are outstanding. So it's, it has an un unlimited supply. There can be as much money as there are transactions in the system. And they are created in response to the demand for credit and they're extinguished when they're paid off. So it arises and is extinguished nat naturally. So you don't have to worry about inflation. And in a, in a mutual credit system, you don't need this single distributed ledger that would, that would cover all transactions. You only need to cover those particular local transactions in your particular system. And then whatever the, the pluses and minuses that are outstanding would be matched to other systems. So you have clearing systems at various levels and that's actually how banks work today. And we have a number of um, cryptocurrencies and pla platform, platforms, protocols that are being developed that do actually track this sort of mutual credit system in a way that's very efficient, very cheap, and very fast. One of them is Ripple, which is what banks are using today. Um, I think about 70 banks are on the Ripple system. Uh, which Ripple was actually originally designed as a community for community currencies, but the designer realized that you can't really get community currencies to talk to each other because they're based on trust within the local community, and that just doesn't compute across, or at least he thought so. And so, so he developed something that banks could use based on that model, and they are using it. Um, there's Holochain, which does connect community currencies, or they say they do. I'm not a, I'm not a um, programmer myself, so I don't totally understand all these technical details. And then there's Bancor, which was, it was a $146 million ICO that came online in the spring that I don't really understand that either, but they say that you can use it to 
value any currency that has any sort of market without a market maker. So it's, it's valued, it's sort of, it's an internal market maker. So you can have a price, you can sell it and buy it without having a counterparty. So that would allow a variety of currencies to speak to each other, trade across, um, trade across the whole system. Um, but so in order to have true financial sovereignty, we the people need to be able to create our own money and that is actually possible with these new uh, cryptographic techniques. As um, Hyman Mitsky said, he was an economics professor, he said anyone can create money. The trick is to get it accepted. So if you went to the grocer, for example, and you tried to pay with your IOU, the grocer is not going to take it because he doesn't know you and he doesn't know um, whether you have the ability to pay, he doesn't know how to follow up. But if you go to the bank, the bank will take your IOU and that's because they will have you sign papers, they'll figure out whether you can pay it back, they know where to find you, um, they then turn your money into a negotiable instrument, which is simply bank credit, <clears throat> but we recognize that bank credit as money. And then they're willing to do it because they're going to charge some nice interest for it. Um, banks actually operate on the mutual credit model. They don't operate on the, most people think, including bankers themselves, that they take in money and lend it out again. But that's not actually how banks work. What they actually do is um, turn the credit of the borrower into money. And this was acknowledged by the Bank of England in the spring of 2014 in their quarterly report, in which they said, banks do not act simply as intermediaries, lending out deposits that savers place with them. Commercial banks create money in the form of bank deposits by making new loans. Bank deposits, in fact, they said, make up 97% of the money currently in circulation. So basically, they just write the money into your account without regard to what money they have on hand. And then you can write checks on that account or use your debit card. And um, the U.S. money supply is, is about equivalent, about 95% is created by banks. It's actually 10% of the of the M2 money supply is actually paper money, but half of it is held abroad. So if you're only counting what circulates in within the US, it's about 95% is um, created by banks. <clears throat> so they do it by double entry bookkeeping. If you sign a mortgage, you go to the bank and you sign a mortgage for $500,000, they will write that $500,000 into on one side of their books as an asset to themselves because you're going to pay them that over time plus interest. And then they'll write it as a liability to themselves because when you write your check to the seller, if it, the seller's in another bank, they will have to clear that check. But they don't really have to come up with the money until that happens. And that's only assuming they don't have the money coming in from somewhere else. So you could arguably have like the bank next door could also have a $500,000 mortgage that they just created and then check finds its way into, so bank A receives a check for $500,000 and bank B receives a check for $500,000, both created on the books of another bank. So all banks have money coming in and out all day and they only have to keep track at the end of the day. So the books only have to balance at the end of the day. And so if they're lucky, they will have gotten as much in as went out and there's no problem. But that 500,000 times two that was created on the books of the banks will have added a million dollars to M2 because M2 includes checkbook money. So if their books don't balance, what they do is they borrow, but they just borrow overnight. And they borrow very cheaply so they can borrow from other banks, that's what they used to do. Now they've started borrowing from the federal home loan banks because the Fed is paying interest on excess reserves, or they can borrow from the money market. And then of course they, and then they give it back the next day. And they do that over and over and over until, they're, until they no longer have a deficit. So what's wrong with this system? It's actually a good system in, in that we are turning our own credit into money. The problem is the banks, the banker middlemen, which um, legally they own the deposits. 
They control where they go. They can gamble with them. Um, they can lend to their cronies very cheaply and lend to us very expensively. Or they can refuse to lend at all. And in fact, it serves them not to create enough money to, to satisfy the needs of the economy because that will force people to borrow to pay off their loans. Um, and it forces governments to borrow and then when they run out of assets or uh, revenues, then they have to sell their utilities and they sell them very cheaply and then private financiers can buy them up. Plus, we, these are supposedly trusted third, parties, third party intermediaries, but we don't actually trust the banks because they have been caught in multiple frauds um, over just recently. They've been caught in over a dozen felonies, including interest rate rigging, um, bid rigging on mini bond debt, concealing risk from investors, mortgage fraud, and then the latest was Wells Fargo's creating two million in fake accounts. So that's not really where we want our money, or that's, we, it would be great if we could do that ourselves, turn our own credit into money ourselves, and I think we can. Uh, another problem is the growth imperative. When banks lend money at interest, if they lend it over, a, say it's a 30-year loan, um, you will pay as much in interest as you pay in principal, but the bank only created the, in, the principal. So where is the interest going to come from? Uh, somebody somewhere needs to borrow. So it's, it's an exponential curve. Um, debt always grows faster than the real economy. I know there's an argument to be made that because you only pay it back month after month, that if the bank were to return the money to you in some way, like if they were to hire you to scrub their floors, then you could pay month after month the same money and pay off the debt. But the problem is that, first of all, they don't hire their borrowers. And um, m most bank profits actually just go into more money-making money schemes, like more loans that uh, would incur more interest, or they go into offshore tax havens, et cetera, speculative investments. So you have this whole speculative economy built on top of the productive economy. The productive economy is uh, supporting both of them. So you have exponential growth in this um, in debt, which is unsustainable. And then the third problem with the current system is risk. That uh, we have, we've seen bailouts in 2008, and now it's bail-ins, where they actually legally are required, if they're insolvent, the biggest banks are required to take the money of their creditors and turn it into uh, bank equity, and the, the largest class of creditor of any bank is its depositors. So they can actually confiscate our money. And we particularly saw this risk with the 2008 collapse, which cost us 9 million jobs, 10 million foreclosures, 19 trillion in lost in household wealth, and uh, local governments forced into privatization, and uh, it was actually re in response to that crisis that Bitcoin was developed. So we've seen this over and over for the last two centuries where booms and busts, booms and busts, and yet we continue to support these banks. Most businesses that routinely become insolvent um, wind up going out of business. So why is it that Wall Street is still in control? <clears throat> the answer was um, provided by Robert Hemphill, credit manager of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta in 1934 during the Great Depression. He said, we are completely dependent on the commercial banks. Someone has to borrow every dollar we have in circulation, cash or credit. If the banks create ample synthetic money, we are prosperous. If not, we starve. So how can we get that power back Collectively, we can get it back by actually owning the banks. I mean, I think we can get it back individually, and I'll go into that, but the first step would be to turn the banks into public utilities, or at least some of them. The original model for this was in Benjamin Franklin's colony of Pennsylvania. During colonial times, all the colonies 
issued their own money in the form of paper script, which was, it was supposedly advance, an advance against taxes. So they would issue the money and then pull it back, issue it and pull it back. But it was a lot easier to issue the money than to pull it back at a time when you didn't have records of these frontiersmen. You, it was hard to find them and to collect the taxes. So a lot of the colonies wound up um, inflating their money supplies and the money supply devalued. But in Pennsylvania, the money supply held its value because they set up this system where they actually, the government owned a bank. It was a land bank. And um, what they did was lend to farmers at 5% interest, which was actually a better rate. Well, they couldn't, there weren't, it's not like they had a bank on every corner. There weren't banks then. But the Bank of England was charging 8%, so 5% was a good rate then. Uh, so what they could do, hypothetically, say they, they printed up $105. You could lend $100 at 5% interest to spend the $5 on things that governments are expected to do. So you'd have 105 out there to pay principal and interest. It would all come back as principal and interest. You could lend the 100 all over again, spend the 5 all over again. It would all come back as principal and interest. And you could do that over and over. Uh, without inflating the system, and they actually did do that. There was no inflation caused by money printing. There were certain products did go up because of scarcity. Um, they did not. Uh, there were. They did not pay taxes. There was no government debt, and um, well, they paid an, an excise tax on liquor. That was the only tax, and there was no growth impairment imperative. Today, we have one publicly owned bank. That's the Bank of North Dakota, the publicly owned depository bank. In California, we have an infrastructure bank, but it's not, it's not a depository bank that actually create, creates money on its books as depository banks do. So the Bank of North Dakota was established in 1919 when the um, farmers were going through a depression and they were losing their farms to the big out-of-state banks, and they decided they wanted to keep their money in the state for their own purposes. So they formed a political party called the Nonpartisan League, managed to win an election, set up this bank, um, and it's been going ever since. And uh, North Dakota, of course, is a very Republican state, so this was not about socialism. It was about state sovereignty, keeping our money locally for our own purposes. They have a mandate to serve the public, and yet they're extremely profitable. In fact, according to the Wall Street Journal in the fall of 2014, the Bank of North Dakota is actually more profitable than Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase. It had a return on equity of 18.5%, which was about 70% higher than Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan. So how did they do it? According to that writer, it was because of oil profits. But right after that, there was a, an oil bust, which significantly hurt the economies of all the oil states, including North Dakota. And yet, the Bank of North Dakota has reported record profits every year. So in 2016, they reported profits for 2015 of 7.4 billion, or they, sorry, asked total assets of 7.4 billion. And that's in a state with 670,000 people. So if you scale that up to the size of California, which is where I'm from, you could have a $370 billion bank, which it would be right up there with the big Wall Street banks. Um, the reason they are so profitable is not oil. It's because of their business model, which is very efficient. By law, all of the state's revenues are deposited in the bank. And then those do, the, that capital and deposits is used to generate credit for the purposes of the community. They don't pay bonuses, fees, or commissions. They have no high-paid CEOs. They have no private shareholders. They don't advertise. They don't need to because they have a captive deposit base. And they don't actually, for the most part, they don't um, make loans directly. They make loans through the local banks. They don't compete with the local banks but partner with them. So the local bank acts as the front office, and that Bank of North Dakota is more like a banker's bank that provides um, credit and li or liquidity and capital, allowing them to make much lo larger loans than they could otherwise. 
And with their savings, they make low interest loans for the community, including 2% loans for infrastructure, compared to like four or 5% in other states. They make student loans that are 2% below what the federal government is making them at. They make 1% loans for startup farms and businesses, which they want to support. And they make low interest loans for affordable housing. So even with these low interest loans, because of the way banking works, because they can leverage their capital by a factor of up to 10, um, they still are a very profitable bank. So we, we now have 31 states that have introduced bills of one sort or another for state owned or publicly owned banks and also a number of municipalities. But none of them has actually achieved that yet. But it's not like the Bank of North Dakota is the only model. Uh, globally, I think in the 70s, 50% of banks were publicly owned. Now it's down to 22% because of this big push for privatization. But still, there are a lot, there are a lot of models globally, including in Germany, where the Sparkassen banks have half the commercial market and are doing very well and support their local businesses. Um, but the, the one I want to talk about is India because they have gotten the closest to a system in which the people themselves can actually create their own credit on a cell phone, turn their own credit into money. So I know India is um, quite controversial because of this demonetization thing they did, but it was, that was because I think 78% uh, of their economy was then running on cash, and so the effort was to get them all onto a digital system, which many people said it wasn't necessary, it was too fast, it was destructive, but not counting that. <laughs> the rest of their system is really very impressive. In fact, they're far ahead of Silicon Valley and what they've done. Um, they're, they've been working on financial inclusion ever since 1955 when the State Bank of India was nationalized. But before that, in 1943, they achieved um, independence from the UK. And they had this massive uh, famine before that where I think it was 143 million people died. So they've got a very large, very poor population that they have to service. So they have the political will to do things that we don't have the political will to do, partly because we've already got this big financial infrastructure that we would have to change. So they just went right for the, right for the jugular and did went right for peer-to-peer -peer, um, cell phone type lending. But the first stage in this, in this development was that in 2010, at that, in 20, before 2010, 50% of the population did not have IDs. And this was because they were born outside of hospitals. They're very poor. And so they couldn't get bank accounts. So they were borrowing like at 60% interest and payday lender rates. So the first thing they did was to give everybody a bank account. There's 1.2 billion people in India, 1.1 billion now, I'm sorry, to give them ID, IDs, 1.1 um, billion, they did this in five and a half years, which was quite remarkable. And the way they did it was with digital eye scans and um, fingerprints. So everybody now can prove who they are, and they've got all that data in their cell phone. So. And then the second thing they did was to make bank accounts very easy to get, and they encouraged people to get bank accounts. Then they developed something called the Unified Payment Interface, which actually bypasses banks and allows users to transfer money peer-to-peer. -peer. Like if you know somebody's phone number, you can transfer money directly, and it doesn't go through a bank. I mean, I assume it comes from, I think it probably comes from the cell phone company, and then you pay the bill at the end of the month. Um, but the, the coup de grace, the tour de force, is uh, something called India Stack, where they have put all your data into one uh, stack. I guess uh, my son is a, I don't really understand these terms myself, but a stack is where you stack up all this data. So you, you've got your medical history, you can have your, uh, what you own, like real estate and track real estate. But you can also have your payment history in this India stack. So it shows whether you've paid your utility bills. And so you can prove that you are a good credit risk. And now they know who you are and where to find you. So now it is actually possible for 
this, I forget what they called this woman, this, and this is an example from their India Stack uh, website. Uh, so here's this little sole practitioner, you know, one person business who previously was borrowing at 60%. Now she can take her cell phone and say, I need a loan for $500, and that will go out to lenders, not necessarily banks, but peer-to-peer -peer lenders, like anybody that wants to lend her money, and they will give, tell, say what the terms are on the cell phone, and then she'll pick the best terms, and in five minutes, she'll have a loan. So she has actually monetized her own, she has actually turned her own loan into money. But of course, there is a third party involved. I mean, there's a, a bank, or probably, most likely, it's the phone company. That's how they do it in India, I'm sorry, in Africa, with M-Pesa, where uh, you pay, the, the bill goes on your phone bill, and then you pay at the end of the month. So it's very like a credit card. But you, so you could have a totally interest-free system. Instead of charging interest, if you don't pay, what you can do, do is just cut off the phone service, and this would be such a big threat that, of course, everybody would do their best to pay. But interest is also a good way to keep you from losing your credit. So basically, you have instant credit through your cell phone with all your data in there, and your data is controlled by you. So you can share it or not. So you can choose to share it with these, whichever lender you choose. So arguably, you could use these new systems, blockchain and um, crypto cryptography, or something like blockchain, in order to do that on a cell phone without, without borrowing the money from somewhere else. Now that we know that the way banks work is that they actually create the money and just they create the money in, in an account and they just lend it to you. It could be created in the cloud. In fact, I think ideally it would be denominated in dollars because everybody trusts the dollar. And many central banks, including the Fed, are looking into central bank digital currencies. So if the central bank is the backer, so it's based, the central bank has this unlimited um, deep pocket. They can't go bankrupt and you are basically drawing from the central bank's deep pocket or from the cloud. You're turning your own credit into money. Your bar, your, um, whoever you're, the merchant or whoever you're paying knows that you're good for the money because it will be tracked in your cell phone. If you don't pay, you'll be cut off from the system in which, and you want to keep the system, so of course you will pay. Um, so in effect, we will be monetizing our own credit, which is which would actually give us financial sovereignty, which I think is all very exciting. So I guess I have time for, I'm not even sure what time it is, but for um, questions or comments? None. <laughs> uh, so um, if you want more information on public banking, our website is publicbankinginstitute.org, or my books are on ellenbrown.com, and these are my two on this subject. I guess I do. I, I'm sorry, I don't see a clock. I guess I have more time. But so I, I could talk a little bit about central bank digital currencies. I know that's quite controversial, but they're talking, they're looking into blockchain, and the reason they're looking at it is that they want to open up the, the central bank already has a digital currency, but it's only available to other banks. It's where the reserves come from. But that what they're talking about is opening that up to everybody. So we could all have an account at the central bank. And the advantage would be the central bank is a deep pocket. You don't need um, deposit insurance. The bank can't go bankrupt. Everybody probably would move, or most people would move their accounts into the central bank because it's so much more secure. You don't have to have this big repo market that's built on... Um, having a place for people with more than $250,000 to park their money and make a little interest. They could be doing it right at the central bank. Um, and so that, but that would just be, what they're talking about is just for um, deposits. And then the concern is, well, then they'll be stealing the deposits from the other banks, and then the other banks won't be able to have, have the liquidity they need to create loans. But it seems to me that there's no reason the central bank couldn't open up their, their lending window as well as their deposit window. So basically, you would be doing all these transactions on your cell phone 
if, if you had a program that were, was set up such that um, it was all in the algorithm in smart contracts, the central bank really wouldn't be in there. I mean, we, everybody, alarm bells go off when you say central bank, but the, the national currency is accepted by everyone and if, if it were immutable, all those things that you get with a blockchain, then you could trust the system. It couldn't be manipulated by central bankers or by anyone else. So I think that's what's coming and that we will, in fact, become our own uh, sovereign, become our own bankers. Uh, a question. <laughs> yeah, so I was just wondering, um, so would that become like another money measure, like N4 or something? Or are you, are you saying that this blockchain, or this dollar denominated blockchain money uh, will exist in the same, will it compete with the dollar? No, I don't think, I think it would be the dollar, it would be digital dollars. Oh, okay, cool. It, it would be digital dollars. It would It'd be basically shifting what banks do now, what private banks do now, shifting it to a public system. Of course, ideally, you would want to make it a public system. In other words, make the Federal Reserve a truly public institution required to serve the interests of the public. But if you put it on a blockchain with smart contracts, the central bankers aren't going to be able to manipulate it anyway. So. Would it be an open ledger also? Would you be able to see the transactions and verify the transactions like you would? Yeah. Well, you could set it up either as... Yes, you would, but you could set it up either as a public system or a private system. I saw a central banker in, from the ECB talking about this, and he said you could do it either as a private thing like Bitcoin, where it would be digital cash. But the problem is, I mean, there are certain advantages to making it public, and one is that you would have recourse. You know, right now with Bitcoin, your money's gone. If the product you get in return for your Bitcoin is not what you were expecting, there's nobody to sue. You can't take it, take it into court. So you would have all the, you would have all the protections of a public system. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> oh yes. Do you envision that it would this uh, public banking solution would tie in with uh, the members' current credit credit status to monetize, or would everybody's all new members start with at a zero basis or some loan of, 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 of eligibility and then go up and down based on their new uh, repayment uh, history? Well, it seems like you could design it however you wanted. That would be up to whoever, it's sort of a, maybe up to Congress, I don't know, whoever decides what parameters we want baked into this algorithm. Okay, thank you very much.